Broadway World. I'm Anna Klumski. And I'm Gillian Jacobs. And we are in the fabulous life of a size zero. At the DR2 in Union Square. Well, I play a um, <clears throat> girl who's a high school senior applying to Harvard and uh, a real great student, but not too popular. So she decides to follow the advice of superstar, become bulimic, lose a lot of weight, get popular. But she kind of loses her uh, way along the path. Bulimia wasn't losing her way? No, it was the stuff that came <laughs> later. That actually helped her out a lot. She got a boyfriend. That's true. <laughs> also aided Tell by him everything. My, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> aided by my friend. Oh, yes. I, uh, I play um, many characters, but um, most of my stage time is playing Heather, which is girl's best friend. Um, and, you know, I'm just kind of on that journey with her. And then I also play other characters that um, kind of give voice to other teenage girls around the country in monologue, blog type form. I think because it doesn't just come from media, it comes from parents, like you see in the play, it comes from your peers. Um, and you know, when you hit adolescence, there's this whole other world of attraction and wanting to be desirable to the opposite sex and I think boys as much as girls have ingested this uh, image of women that's been produced by the media so that maybe their expectations of girls match what they see in magazines as well so I think that um, everyone wants to be loved everyone wants to fit into the image of the norm and parents want what they think is best for their kids but they don't always know the best way to go about mm -hmm. getting that for them um, I also think that celebrity culture has become much per more pervasive through blogs and websites and um, that, uh, that we know more and more about the day-to-day -day lives of our celebrities so maybe that makes it feel more attainable in a way because we know so many facts about them, feel like we know them even though we don't. And so why can't you wear their jeans and drink their favorite drink and go to the clubs that they like to go to. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. It's um, what, how you uh, mentioned. I feel, like the, I, I, I feel like the eating disorders and the, the feeling that you need to be a celebrity, that you need to fit into something, that you need to, to please somebody in order for them to love you, I feel like all of that, a lot of the subjects of this show are maybe even a function of a deeper problem, which is... Um, a sense of worthlessness. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel that there are a lot of people, and that that definitely bridges the gender gap too. You know, I think a lot of people um, spend a lot of their lives just trying to find some sense of self worth, and um, and then they would look at the, you know the media and be like, oh well, I'm not worthy. See, I have proof. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to necessarily somebody on the page calling them unworthy. I, I mean, it's all. I don't. I, I never necessarily felt like I was any kind of a, a role model because I was ten years old, and I definitely was looking for a role model myself. Do you know? Um, I and I, I also feel like I definitely wasn't in in the public eye half as much as maybe even some people wanted me to be. I, um, you know, I, I, I definitely. If anybody thought that I was their role model, my goodness, like they'd be like, I want to go to the west side of Chicago and go to it. Well, your parents like, kept what they? you. Your parents didn't move you to LA. They kept no, you to they Chicago. didn't because I asked not to. Yeah. I was like, I want to stay. You know, from from day one, that was something that my mom did very well, which was that she she always um, she always asked me what my what I wanted. You know, she never t told me to do anything. She was always saying, you know, do you want to keep modeling in Sears catalogs? And and at one point, I I think I was just like, no, I I don't feel like it. And she's like, okay, we won't do that anymore. And. Um, and to an eight-year-old, I don't feel like it is pretty much <laughs> what you're going to get. You're not going to get an existential reason why not. But That's a big theme of the show is the anyone can be a star theme. And, right, I mean, mm -hmm. you can speak more to that because that's definitely more your character. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a compulsion among teenagers to maybe share too much sometimes. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, you can give it sort of minute-by-minute minute updates of your life. And... Um, but I remember, to take it to a serious level, uh, when the Virginia Tech shootings happened, there was a kid who was writing on Live Journal, and he became sort of the media fixated on him as this kid who's there experiencing it and writing it firsthand. And, you know, they all sort of swarmed on him, and he was getting thousands of requests for interviews. And 
I think that it is a way for kids to reach a world wide audience, especially in a time of crisis like that or something that's you know compelling to the media. Um, like especially if you don't fit in at your school or you're not super popular and you can find a community online and feel like you have connections to people and that you don't feel so alone. I think that's maybe the positive aspect of I think that the more it happens to the more you know the, the more uh, intense it gets and um, I think just being educated, about what could happen with it, who's watching, you know, it's, yeah. it, 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 there, there's gonna, there has to be a balance of knowing that you're writing stuff that people will be reading, and you got, you know, it, it's something that, it's, it's a great thing because, yes, it's, it's like journaling, it's like a diary, it's like, you know, it's like Diary of Anne Frank times, times But it'll 20. be interesting to see but if these kids, realize. when they go for job interviews in 10 years, <laughs> if their employer is going to be like, well, I Googled you, and I saw that in sixth grade you like to do yeah, that's a good X, point. Y, and Z. I don't know. It's true. I think, I think, privacy, I think privacy is a, is a very um, lovely thing, and I think we're all, we, it's a right that we all have, and... Um, and, and yeah, if, if you know when before, especially in the, in like a teenager world, or even even preteen, like you know kids, like young young kids, who you know have their own email accounts or something like that, I don't think they have a sense of. They're still trying to make friends. They still want to know. You know, they they're still in the I want to be loved mode, and mm -hmm. and I, I think that it's it's very important that they're educated. Um, about what they are, you know, partaking in when they are doing a blog or a MySpace or something like that because the wrong people could be watching. I think it's all incredibly relatable. I mean, I, I think we all were remembering things from high school, interactions with our parents, mm -hmm. applying to college. You know, I never quite figured out how to become popular in high school, so I didn't even have an opportunity to make some of the mistakes that girl did. I was sitting at home with my mom, watching A and E. So, um, yeah, man. <laughs> um, but I definitely, I mean, it, that like what Anna said, that lifelong search for self worth doesn't end once you graduate from college. So I think to value yourself and. Um, mm and to appreciate what's unique about you because I think that's the thing in high school, everybody wants to conform, nobody wants to stand out, and all the things that make you an interesting adult are liabilities when you're a teenager. Yeah. Professionally, what I've learned about, about the, um, like playing characters like this is that um, it's so easy to maybe do a caricature, you know, of, of these kids or of like what you see on TV and you're like, oh, I know this, this is my super sweet 16, and I got, you know, and just like, make it a caricature but it's it's um it's it's m certainly made me explore this next generation of girls as as people as opposed to just people who talk weird like you know or talk different from myself um you know there's definitely a different language there's definitely a different timbre in in you know they in the, in the youthful voice but um but they're real people and you know you can't you can't shut that out when you're when you're playing them because they they're chances are a lot of the stuff you feel are the stuff that they feel as well. well it's like almost like they're speaking in code the yeahs and whatevers and not even mm -hmm. it's like you're either afraid to say what you're really feeling you're afraid no one's going to listen to you or you don't quite know how to express it so it's they speak to each other in this coded language mm -hmm. that that I, marissa really found yeah yeah and I think that we've had a lot of fun exploring the scenes between the two of us as friends and, and what that, that relationship is like and those subtle betrayals. And yeah. um, I think teenage girls are intensely aware of how they're affecting other people and how they're making other people feel. Yes. So two like very alive people on stage, very concerned about how they're making the other one feel, right. is, it makes for a fun scene. Yes! <laughs> it's kind of creepy. Yeah, we actually, the, right before our first rehearsal, happened to be at the same audition at the same time. And we were waiting for the elevator, and Anna turned to me and said, Are you Gillian? Are you in the Fabulous Zero. Life? Yeah. <laughs> and so then we rode the train up together to the first rehearsal, and we're talking the whole way. So. Yeah, and, yeah. We've, and we've pretty much been at every audition together since then. Yeah. <laughs> Just random, like, hello, there you are. And, uh, and we, did, yeah, bizarre things in common from when we were... But we'd never been in an audition at the same time prior to that. Exactly. But now since we've started doing the show, 
see each other all the time. The universe <laughs> works in mysterious ways. It's a film adaptation of a play by Adam Rapp that was done in New York a couple years ago. And we shot it in 18 days. It was a really low budget, quick shoot. It was a wonderful experience. I was opposite Paul Sparks, who I'm sure broadwayworld.com readers know and love. Um, and uh, a lot of other great New York stage actors. And um, yeah, you know, it took us a, over a year to find an audience. It played at the South by Southwest Film Festival this year, which was wonderful and um, really gratifying to get have people finally see it. I'm not sure as to the status at this present moment, but I hope that someday we'll find distribution because I think it's a really great film with some great performances. I hope to see it too. Yes, yes absolutely. That's that was a piece I was I was writing pretty much. I, that was like my ambition for a few years when I thought that I was done with show business, which is what the article's about. And um, I uh, I was publishing. Um, I was an editorial assistant, and there was a, a book, an, an anthology that came came across my desk for an anthology of, of essays by writers about being in their in their twenties and being in their what they call the pre life crisis. And um, I I just remember being up all night thinking about wow this I have something to write about that, and it was called Peaking at Ten. And um, at the time, it really wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the article that it became. It became a much better article because in the meantime of me working with those girls and I came back to, to show business, which I feel is really what I'm, I'm here to do and which is really my calling. And, and I, uh, so it was a much better article because there was something to say. Like there was, oh, hey, here I am. I'm doing, you know, this is, I, I had this weird moment in my life and now I'm, I, I, I know what I want to do. And, um, and they're great girls. It's a really fun anthology called Before the Mortgage. And uh, isn't that cute? <laughs> And um, at your local bookstore. Uh, yeah, it, that, it's an essay from there. And the article was in Sirens. They took the excerpt. If you read through the article, you know, that the beginning is me crying and going to psychics. And then, and then by the end, it's, you know, I'm doing my theater and I'm doing my film and I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy. I, I, would, I would rather be doing, I would not rather be doing anything else. It's witty yes. and smart and biting. See, you and do it heartfelt and it'll make you cry and it'll make you laugh and there's dancing. <laughs> there's the musical numbers. If you want to see Gillian Jacobs dance, <laughs> the only place to find it is at the DR2 until July 1st. Thanks for watching Broadway World from the fabulous life of a size zero.